with you. Thank you, John, for that wonderful introduction and invitation into worship this morning. If you have your back one, if you'll raise your hand, I think there may still be a part of the two there. Um, encourage you to uh, work on those at any point during the service, uh, especially when you get bored in the middle of the sermon, behind the coloring away. Uh, and uh, so we're continuing to work on our mosaic for Transfiguration Sunday. We'll unveil uh, the art project that we have collectively contributed to on Transfiguration. Please rise in body or in spirit. And join me in the call of worship. Time passes. Seasons change. But God remains steadfast and sure as a deeply rooted tree. The leaves of the tree of life make a balm for the healing of the nation. Let us come to the giver of life. Let us rest in our creator. Let us worship God together. Touch of the water. 
that claims us as your beloved children, that calls us to a path of continued discipleship, that reveals to us the light of your glory. Help us receive the power of that gift. Holy Spirit, pour it out on us to follow you in faith and hope and love. Amen. <coughs> We wander and we stray, but God continues to reach out to us with mercy, with love, proclaiming that promise that God will receive us. Let us make our confession and receive God's welcome. Sustaining God, you would have us be deeply rooted in you, finding strength in your word and nourishment in your grace. More often, though we live as chaff, blown here and there by the winds of circumstance, forgive our lack of permanency and our failures to hold fast to our commitments. Grow in us faith that we might be firmly planted in your promises, released from sin, open to the life that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. Now hear our silent, personal prayer and confession. <laughs> Friends, the water of grace refreshes our life and brings forth in us a new creation. This is good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
these are in your pew slide, in your pews, that we, we will mark those and put those in the offertory. That's the question for now. That's great. And the second thing is empty bowls. If you'll notice in your bulletin, you have a QR code. And the QR code really works easy. I tried it on my phone. You can do it while you're sitting in the queue. You can do it on your way home. You can order your empty bowl tickets using that code. But if you don't want to do that, Chris has her clipboard and her envelopes. You can get them in bulk. We have 10 tickets to take to sell. <laughs> so we have plenty of bowls. We have plenty of tickets. Okay. Hi, guys. How are you? This is another week of doing our art projects. And I see you all are so creative. I love to see the results of these. You notice we still have our mosaic up. That's one of the ways that we can, during this art time, we see Jesus in many ways. We can see his face there, but in his face are all of our faces, which is really cool. We hear beautiful music like what you just heard that teaches us about Jesus and tells us all kinds of things. And we see pictures everywhere. So we recognize Jesus. If you see a pic, you don't have to ask, who is that? What's the picture do? You know who that is. You have a question, Deb? Did Pastor Greg do that? No, he did not. <laughs> but that's a great question. That should make him feel really good. <laughs> so we don't have to say, who is that in that picture? We know. We recognize him, right? Is it a what? A painting? It is a mosaic. And that's what we're using our square stories to make. Lots of little pictures, like lots of little squares, into one big, awesome picture. And you'll see that soon. So I was thinking, what would it be like if we lived in the days when Jesus lived? Would we recognize him then? We recognize him now, because everybody has told us that's what he looked like. But if we lived in those days, would we recognize him as the Messiah? Or would we just say, oh, he's a nice guy? I don't know if I follow him or not, but he's a nice guy. So it does make me wonder if we would recognize him if we lived with him. So sometimes it's hard for us to believe in things we can't see. I would probably be willing to say none of you have seen Jesus or talked to Jesus or had him sit beside you and talk to you, but we still know he was real. We still know he was alive and there. If we had been alive at that time, we would have seen him do some awesome things. But I bet you see some things that he does. Raise your hand if somebody in this church greeted you when you came in this morning. Good. Uh, what if you put your hand down and raise your hand if you have ever seen anybody do the nice deed for somebody? Oh, yeah. Good deal. So all of you have seen Jesus at work through us. Those are the things that we do that Jesus would have done through his time. So if we were alive when he was there, the things we might have seen him do would be miracles, like raising the sick and praying over people that were ill, raising the dead, healing the sick, raising the dead, and walking on water. That's pretty awesome, right? But he also taught people out of doing bad things and showed them how to do good things, like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Remember, he was in the tree? He was a tax collector that took people's money when they were supposed to. And after talking to Jesus, he not only gave his money back, but he never did it again. So Jesus was ever was able to teach him what was right and what was wrong and why you should do the right things. So you see that all the time. You see people doing the right things. We know people do bad things. We just have to try to make up that that is not Jesus in there. When the people are doing the good things, and you know Jesus is alive and well. So I'm going to challenge you. Everybody likes a challenge, right? So I'm going to challenge you to do one good thing every day to let someone know that Jesus is in you. Okay? And we'll talk about that after the church. Okay, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for being with us every day. Help us to see and hear you in the people that we see. Remind us to do, to do good things so that others will be able to see you by watching us. In Jesus' name we pray.
second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, starting at verse 25 and going to verse 32. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture, uh, or at least the story that it's a part of is a very familiar passage of Scripture, but you may not uh, have read all the way to the end every time you read it. This is the parable of the prodigal son. And so this is the ending of that parable. Let's listen to the word of the Lord. Now his elder son was in the field. When he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you. And I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who had devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. Because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Holy wisdom. Holy word. Thanks be to God. So today we come to the anti-penultimate sermon in our series on the arts and worship. Now, for those of you who have never had to deal with the rules governing Greek syllables and accents or Latin scansion, uh, let me um, say you can figure out for yourself what sermon we're on and just how many sermons we have left. I'm just kidding. I want to demonstrate for you. If, if, if this is the penultimate sermon, then this is the, no wait, got to start over. I like jokes. If this is the anti-penultimate sermon, then this is the penultimate sermon, and this is the ultimate sermon. There, you'll never forget. Anti-penal, penal, Ultimate. We got three sermons to go. It's a long way of saying that. We spent significant time so far in this series talking about the arts and the mind, the arts and the spirit. Today we want to also make sure we see how the arts and worship are related to our bodies. It's a subject that can, once again, make Presbyterians very Maybe you've seen the meme. There are two identical photos side by side of Senator Bernie Sanders. You know the pose I'm talking about. On the, uh, at the inauguration on the Capitol steps in a folding chair with a mask on, uh, clearly cold, like some of you are today in sanctuary. And, and he's got his arms folded with these mittens, these huge mittens, you know, sitting there like this. The meme says at the bottom, at least the version I saw, Pentecostals, bored with a sermon. And then the next one says, Presbyterians, ecstatic and enjoying a sermon. <laughs> well, you know I was raised in a Pentecostal church. I was very much used to seeing and hearing and dodging and staying clear of bodies in motion during worship. 
Sometimes even during the sermon, the preacher would get on a roll and once in a while you'd hear it. All right now, and preach it. Preach it, brother. It was usually a brother. If the preacher really got going on the subject, it resonated deeply with everyone. Uh, those amens would be accompanied by clapping. You know, not applause. And not the rhythmic sort of thing that you get, you know, at a ball game or something. But an encouragement. A push a little bit. You see why it's so hard for me to preach. Next time, maybe. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Presbyterians all be like, sir. <laughs> but as Carolyn Deutery reminds us in a book called The Liturgy as Dance and the Liturgical Dancer, we are embodied spirit and inspirited flesh. That's how our Creator made us to be. The relationship between the spirit and the body, indeed the entire Christian attitude toward the human body, comes into play when we begin to talk about the arts and worship. There are no arts and there is no worship, no liturgy, without both the body and the spirit. Maybe you will remember this verse from our sermon series on the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, when Paul turns to sort of the practical implications of living out the Christian life, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, we like to use that particular verse at offering time. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present yourselves to God. Your offerings will now be received. Right? The only time really during the worship service in Presbyterian church where Presbyterians are allowed to sort of get up and move, move around a little bit. And if you, you don't need to demonstrate, okay, no. So, you know, the rest of the time, Presbyterians be like. But if you happen to be in sort of the middle of the pew, when the offering plays, and you can do this intentionally, you know, situate yourself right there. The offering starts to come down, but you sort of have to scooch over <laughs> to get to the offering plate to put your offering in the play. So the first point has to be that the body and the spirit are not antithetical. They go together. We put them together, even in the theology of good St. Paul. They go together. There was a heresy called Manichaeism that held the antithetical point of view. Right? Their way of thinking the body was evil and the spirit was good and never the two should really meet. But the body and worship are not antithetical. They both belong to the created integration of the whole human Person. We were made to be this way. Christianity is based on physicality. It's something that we remind ourselves on Ash Wednesday, just two and a half weeks from now. When we come forward, there's that little bowl of ashes, and the preacher says to us, he firmly puts a thumb on our forehead, remember that you are dust, and to dust, you shall return. Remember, you are embodied spirit. You are in spirited body. The rest of the time we'll be like, mm. So the first point, and that's one of the only services where I invite you to meet people. As we pray the song of confession. way of getting at the embodied. As Marina Herrera and Ellie Murphy write in their article on the religious nature of dance, symbolically, the body is there for each of us, for all of us, as a reminder of our earthiness. The first man who was created is called Adam, earthly, because he comes from the earth, from the ground. 
our material nature, our rootedness in time and space. When you enter into this cavernous space, right, this beautiful sanctuary, you do so with your body. Your ears. So when I speak, you can hear can you hear the resonance, the reverb. Right? And you know where you are sitting partly from your ears, from your hearing. Partly from your vision. Partly from those internal parts of your body that give you balance that tell you where you are in space and time. Part of what I'm saying is that, well, Charlie Patterson's experience of worship is different from my experience of worship in many, many ways. And not just because he's a different person, he's in a different place in this sanctuary than I am. Now, he may hear Mary Jo singing. I can't always, Mary Jo, you need to. And, and, but he probably can't hear Craig, Craig, see if you laugh. Like, come on. He can't hear Craig singing, probably. It depends, it depends on where you are as to how you experience worship in this place, because it's an embodied experience. Even our sense of smell tells us where we are. we enter this place. I don't know if you happen to watch CBS Evening News. Beth and I caught it again <clears throat> the final feel-good segment this Friday on the road with Steve Hartman. It was about uh, a bunch of high school choral students at the uh, All-State Choir from Kentucky who had gathered in Louisville. Did any of you happen to see? No. Okay. I, I encourage you to, to go onto the web, either the CBS Evening News or YouTube or whatever, and just Google the Kentucky All-State Choir Hyatt Regency or something like that and, and listen to, see this video. Um, but it's incredible. These students from all over have gathered for music, and the Hyatt Regency has been hosting this thing for so long that they now give out earplugs <laughs> to to all of the uh, folks who come and register for that particular time in the hotel. So it's one of these hotels, you know, that's built in a tower. All the uh, rooms, or at least that central core of rooms, are in a circle around this tower that many, many floors high. And on this particular occasion, the students are all standing out in the hall, shouting at one another across this big atrium. A massive noise, good thing for earplugs, but, but all of a sudden, one of the groups starts to harmonize and sing. And slowly, it spreads all the way around and all the way up and down that atrium. And they sing the national anthem together, and it is the most glorious thing you've ever heard, even in our living room from this little bitty TV set, you can tell what a glorious experience it must have been to be there. The person who happened to catch it on video just pans around the bottom of the atrium where a bunch of adults you know, are hanging out. And some of them literally lay themselves out on the couches like this to just feel the music through them. Friends, we have had quite a two-year experience in serving worship. You know what I mean. I am grateful from the depth of my heart for the choir and for Hannah and for everyone, Morgan and Adamus and all, who made it possible for us during extended periods when we could not gather here in this place to provide the little box <laughs> with the service and the music and all on it. But I am so grateful that now we gather. Now we hear the organ. Now we hear the singing. We 
young man named Athanasius, who would one day be best known for his defense of Orthodox Christianity against the Arian heresies. Before he was 20 years old, wrote one of the most influential works in the history of Christian literature. It's called De Incarnatione. On the Incarnation of the Word of God. The question that Athanasius asks is why? Why would the God who created the universe, the Word of God, in all His grandeur and greatness, become flesh? Be manifested in bodily form and become truly human. In other words, why would God become embodied for us? Once again, the answer lies in that great sweep that we've been talking about of that overarching Christian story of the history of the world, the meta-history, if you will. God made the world good. And sin destroyed the goodness that God made. So out of God's great love for us, God entered into the world to save us. Friends, what that does is bring the creation of the world and our salvation all together into one big earthy mess. God enters into our embodiment. Creation is earthly, and salvation is earthly. God comes to renew the creation with the self-same word who created us in the beginning. God was not content that sin and evil and death would now characterize this world. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us. As the gospel says, full of grace and truth, he embodied it. He embodied grace. He embodied truth. His body then was scourged, and a crown of thorns was placed on his head. His body was nailed to a cross, as the creed says, for us and for our salvation. He became incarnate. The incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection of the body, these all drive that point home that we believe worship to be a fully embodied experience, to be celebrated physically with the body as an instrument. Sometimes it's difficult for us to celebrate embodiment. In our contemporary society, it's difficult for me knowing that I need to lose a few pounds, that I'm overweight, okay, more than a few pounds. That my BMI, as my doctor tells me every time I see him, is not ideal. Knowing that as I age, my hearing is getting worse. My eyes have been terrible for a long time. And I can only imagine what others who have other disabilities, who enter into worship in a wheelchair or with a cane or legally blind or deaf from birth, how they must feel and what they must feel when the media idolize ideal bodies. Ideal strength, ideal abilities, ideal ages. Here's what I know. In this space, where our Creator is worshipped, persons of every body type and every ability or lack of ability are welcome to offer their bodies here as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That is our spiritual worship. But with very little time that I have left, what does any of this have to do with the arts? Well, as we hinted at earlier, a key to embodiment in worship is dance. And before you crucify me, but they crucified Jesus, let me explain. Ted Shawn, one of the pioneers of modern sacred dance, once said, dance is the only art in which we ourselves are the stuff of which it is made. Dance is perhaps the only art form that literally involves embodiment. Other art forms involve the body. Performance art, music, visual art, theater, even, you know, finger paint. It involves physicality. Ask any kids, you know, it's not so much the coloring, it's the feel of that paint on the paper. 
but it's dance that moves the body with purpose. The Bible is full of dance. Moses leading the procession of Israelites on dry ground to the Red Sea. Miriam then leading a dance party on the other side. Joshua leading the people of Israel marching around the walls of Jericho, blowing their trumpets, shouting, and round and round they go. David dancing in front of the Ark of the Covenant as it makes its way into Jerusalem. Victory dances of all sorts for David, for Saul, for Jephthah's daughter with the tambourine, wedding dances, worship dances throughout the Psalms. The early church father Ambrose writes, let us not be ashamed of a show of reverence, which will enrich the cult and deepen the adoration of Christ. For this reason, the dance must in no wise be regarded as a mark of reverence for vanity or luxury, but something that uplifts every living body instead by allowing the limbs to rest motionless on the ground or the feet to stay planted in the ground and become numb. You gotta move. The Christian tripudium, which was a dance that's very, very simple. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. It was a celebration, an intentional celebration of resurrection of life. There were dances for mourning as well. Art is embodied. Dance is there. Wherever we are intentional about our postures, good old Presbyterian, our movements, our gestures, when we stand, when we sit, when we kneel, when heaven forbid we raise our hands. Yeah, Presbyterians who do that tend to sit in the back. The simplest profession, procession from communion to offerings, the baptisms, the weddings, the funerals, the lifting up of the bread at the table. The sign of the cross in water, in oil, in ashes, the benediction. Worship is a sort of dance, a play with the different movements that, taken all together, form a coordinated dance of the body of Christ. It grows organically from the dance of life that is performed in each and every simple gesture and movement of our day-to-day -day experience. It is what unifies us in the offering of our whole self, body, soul, and spirit, to the one who made us. It integrates this community and each of us individually, giving expression to our feelings, to our physical presence, to our cognitive and spiritual capacities, all of it, all together. It unites us. It offers us hope. For the redemption of the whole person and the whole community. And it's with every bit of art it communicates. It communicates joy and sorrow and grief and pain. The heights of our human existence and the depths. And it puts us in touch with the sacred. With God. Who is our chief goal. And our greatest joy.
we've said several times uh, during the series, it's okay, keep drawing. There is kinetic prayer. Uh, just keep working on your art. It's also okay, Presbyterians, uh, raise your hands, hold your hands up, pray for it, let's pray. Gracious God, we come to you as always with grateful hearts. Thankful for your goodness and your grace to us. We pray for your church this morning. Let everything that we say and do be done for the sake of the gospel and for sharing the blessing and joy of your salvation. We pray for our world. So many ways it seems broken and anxious and fearful. So we pray for your peace. We pray for peace in the Ukraine, especially for all of those whose lives are in danger. Lift up the downtrodden, gather up the outcast, rebuild the ruined cities, and heal our wounded planet. Heal our world. We pray for our community. We pray especially for our loved ones. For Raina. For the family of Bob Gandhi. For Ruby Jean McLeod. For Kim Smith. For Tamara and David Faust. For Melanie Cobb. For Vicki Duncan's mother and father. For Vicki. For Leo. Tom Hustler, for Dick Pryor, for Jay, for Lou, for Arch, Reach out, O oh God, for those who are sick or hurting. And by your healing touch, lift them up so that they may live to serve you. Strengthen all of your people so that we may live in this world as those whom you have chosen and called to embody your good news, your forgiveness, your grace. And now teach us again to pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And by our ushers to come forward, your offerings will now be received, and you can move around intentionally, but move around.
the wisdom of your word, the generosity of your love and grace. Let the gifts of our lives bear witness to your goodness and mercy, your faithfulness and your justice, your steadfast love for all. Amen.